You know, I, I tell you, Petros, you know, I, I know that Niagara's got the big headline, but there were so many interesting bladder studies at ESMO 24. I mean, if you think about it, like, you know, like we had the, the CTDNA with the Tambala study. I, I mean, the Volga study. I mean, you had uh, in the metastatic setting, we had our colleague, Dr. Golsky, talk about first line metastatic for, you know, for uh, HER2 study. I mean, there's so much. But like we want to kind of focus on the, the Niagara study. And I, I tell you, all the friends and colleagues that we talked to, superb, outstanding job at the discussion, very well balanced. I felt like you put in a lot of information about not just the, the point that we got to the Niagara study, but also future studies, things that we can kind of look forward to because it answered questions. Yes, we have that DFS and overall survival, but it also raises more questions. So what are your thoughts about the Niagara study, uh, Petros? Thank you so much, Sandler, for the kind words. You know, I always re want to receive feedback and always looking forward to do things better in the future. So thank you for the kind words. I, I think Niagara trial was one of the biggest highlights at the ESMO 2024 Congress. What a great effort, right? More than a thousand patients accrued in a localized massive basic bladder cancer study. Uh, kudos to Professor Powell's and all the study team. And of course, to the patients and families, right? And caregivers who contributed to that study. You know, we traditionally had challenge, right? Accruing in these bladder cancer trials. Uh, we know back in the day, challenges in accruing in adjuvant trials, uh, despite all the best efforts. So definitely an important milestone showing the feasibility of accruing in a more than a thousand patient trial when we work together in the multi-center, you know, a global international manner. And I want to underline this global international approach. That's very important. I think everything we do, you know, in, in different organizations, societies, uh, it's great to see this global perspective and global collaboration. But going back to the study, I think uh, this is a, a very, very uh, uh, interesting approach with a perioperative strategy. You have a neoadjuvant component. You have durvalumab add it to the standard of care gem setup in cisplatin. So gem cis plus durvalumab, there were four doses of durva preoperative, neoadjuvantly, and then up to eight monthly doses adjuvantly. So it was kind of a sandwich approach, let's say. Uh, and uh, the control arm was GEMCs for cycles neoadjuvant only with no adjuvant component. So that trial uh, uh, accrued, as I, as I mentioned, for over many years. It finished accrual in July 2021. That was very, uh, uh, I would say, close. Uh, and But before the adjuvant nivolumab got uh, approval by FDA in August 2021 and by EMA in April 2022. And I make this point because of the timing, uh, patients who are in the control arm, like the neoadjuvant GEMCs, uh, many of them, probably most of them, uh, did not have access to adjuvant nivolumab. And of course, that may impact the performance of the control group. And I made this point to the discussion. And of course, the other point is that, you know, subsequent therapies, right? Uh, what people have access to in metastatic disease may also uh, impact overall survival. So we have to keep that in mind as we interpret and dissect the data. Having said that, uh, this study um, uh, was well balanced in terms of the characteristics in the two groups. Uh, I want to give uh, congratulations to the investigators for including divergent histologies. About 15, 1.5% of patients had histology subtype. Uh, of course, the primary histology had to be urothelial. Uh, and uh, about 5%, small proportion, had clinically N1 states. And the interesting thing was that there was about 20% of patients or so that had creatinine clearance below 60 it was, they went down to 40 ml per minute as a cutoff, and they used split doses platin for those uh, patients who had GFR uh, below 60 ml per minute. So we saw some patients who traditionally were deemed ineligible for cisplatin that were included. The pathologic complete response rate, 37% uh, with GEMSYS Durva, 27% with GEMSYS alone, a little bit lower than expected. And we can have some hypothesis why this happened. Uh, you know, it's hand-waving a little bit, but one potential uh, approach is that you, in the denominator of that proportion, there were patients included who did not undergo radical cystectomy because they chose to. About 6%, six single digit, 6% 6 of patients in both arms or so did not undergo cystectomy because of their choice. And these were included in, in the denominator 
but of not in the denominator. So this can uh, lower a little bit the proportion. The other answer question is split doses platin. Does it perform the same with the classical dosing scheme intensity? We have some retrospect retrospective data about that, but we don't have you know level one prospect evidence. I think it's a reasonable approach. We do it in the clinic with borderline GFR. I have done it. Uh, we have retrospective data published with uh, Dr. Koskin and others, but that's another question there uh, that may or not have impacted uh, pathologic CR8. And of course, you know, pathology review, uh, you know, uh, plays role. They had central pathology review there. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, if you look at the actual statistical um, analysis and statistical plan, uh, initially they had 59 patients who were not included in the initial path CR analysis. Uh, and uh, those 59 patients were included in a subsequent analysis uh, that was done and ended up having this delta of 10% uh, in path CR. 27 to 37% path CR8 favoring the uh, Durva arm. And the question I had is, is that 10% delta in path CR adequate enough to explain the significance in EFS event-free survival and OS overall survival. In my mind, this seems unlikely, which in other words, I think the adjuvant component is adding value there. And, and we have seen data from Ambassador, Dr. Apollo, saw the data at ESMO, New England Journal of Medicine paper, and the Czech Medu 7-4, uh, that we know that adjuvant IO, adjuvant anti-PD-1, uh, prolongs disease-free survival. So I think overall, putting everything together, the take-home message for me is the addition of durvalumab to gem did not compromise the ability of patients to get curative intent radical surgery. Uh, the toxicity was very similar in the two arms, so that's reassuring. Uh, of course, we have to think about immune-related adverse events, educate our patients, of course, uh, and the significant difference in event-free survival has a 0.68, and overall survival has a 0.75. Uh, 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 those endpoints make Niagara the only, uh, I would say, localized MIBC trial evaluating checkpoint inhibitor with OS benefit. So I think it's practice changing, uh, despite the caveats and limitations we discussed before. Uh, it's a new paradigm, I would say, and changes everything, right? Because we use checkpoint inhibitor upfront uh, in the neoadjuvant setting. There are many questions that remain, right? For example, do we need both neoadjuvant and adjuvant component? Do we need either? I don't think we know the answer to this question because of the Niagara trial design. For now, I would say that we I would use both neoadjuvant and adjuvant until we know better. Of course, we're going to overtreat patients. And, uh, you know, it, it's the question of how do you select out those who do not or do need, uh, uh, you know, adjuvant treatment. But these are questions for the future. And, of course, what do you do subsequently if a patient has uh, subsequent progression? Is there a role for checkpoint inhibitory talents? Uh, what about blood preservation? Uh, and, of course, uh, the ro role of cDNA? Many unanswered questions, and hopefully the future trials will help us answer those. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think, you know, just I, I think that was a wonderful discussion of what you just mentioned. Like for, for us here in September 2024, standard of care. But that, it does raise some questions like from the patient's journey. Right. So we have a brand new patient, T2, T3. We're talking about it, our tumor board. There's some patients. In fact, a lot of my patients, Petros, I use Dostin's Invac. I mean, based on the Vesper, I do four cycles. You get done in 56 days. You do surgery in five or six weeks later. And, and you know, as long as they don't have cirrhosis, because you have to think about that with the methotrexate, always check the echo. But I do consider doses in VAC. So that, you know, should we still consider that? I mean, do you do that as well, Petros? Do you consider doses in VAC for a neoadjuvant approach? Great point, Sandler. I agree with you. And I actually mentioned in my discussion to your point that personally, myself in clinic, I use those dense MVAC with growth factor support as primary prophylaxis for four cycles for node negative patients. And the big question to me is how the data from Niagara impact that practical pattern. Of course, uh, uh, you can argue that GEMSYS is a very acceptable, reasonable, and the most uh, controlled arm in the Niagara study and is the most commonly used regimen in the neoadjuvant setting you know, across the board. Uh, so I think it was okay that they used that. It was, it was very acceptable and reasonable. Having said that, people like you and me who use those and back in clinical practice, what do we do? I think, I think there are interesting data we saw from the ORA trial, AURA, that was presented at ASCO uh, 2024. Uh, and uh, that trial was a phase two study looking at those dense MVAC 
plus a value map and also gem sys plus a value map in the new adjuvant setting. The trial, of course, was not powered to compare those two combinations, but numerically showed higher path CR rates with those than Senvac plus Avelumab. And, and of course, the safety data uh, overall, toxicity data, uh, were reassuring that you know you can combine those than Senvac uh, plus sigma inhibition. The other interesting point is that uh, uh, there's some preclinical data that people talk about. We have, to, of course, to see more data on that. That adriamycin may be more immunogenic, uh, oh. and so is that uh, potentially uh, having you know some impact there is that those and some fact potentially we don't know but is it the better partner uh with checkpoint inhibition I, I can share with you uh stay tuned because we just completed the phase two trial here at the university of washington for Hats cancer center um looking at those then some vac plus checkpoint inhibitor uh, in patients with histology subtypes and we're hoping to present the data very soon i think this will data will generate some good discussions uh, and, uh, you know, complement uh, the discussion we have today. And of course, uh, we have the uh, in the upper tract disease, which is a separate question that I think merits its own trial. Uh, I want to uh, give a shout out to the Imanus Durvalma. Exactly that question. Uh, that trial has also uh, a cisplatin ineligible cohort with Jamsara and Durvalumab. Uh, and Ginny Hoffman Sensitz, Dr. Hoffman Sensitz from Johns Hopkins is the chair, and I, I'm honored to be the co chair uh, in that study. So hopefully we'll answer the question on upper track disease in the next few years. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the other thing is if you think about the dose sense NVAC, and then if you look at the ambassador study, you look at the Checkmate 274. We have another point where we can kind of evaluate the patient. So if you look at the adjuvant study, T2 or higher. So if they have a T0, T1, they're not getting immunotherapy adjuvant. So I feel like some of these patients might be overtreated there. What are your thoughts about that, Petros? It's a great question, Chandler. I, I think you're right. I think we'll end up over treating uh, uh, some patients. The problem we have right now is we do not have fully uh, validated, reliable uh, biomarkers with clinical utility that can help us select the patients who need adjuvant therapy. Uh, and of course, this is an ongoing effort. It was part of my wish list uh, to Professor Powell's and the study team, give us more data down the road, give us outcomes, ad hoc exploratory analysis, hypothesis generating, but give us those outcomes with disease-free survival and overall survival based on pathologic states, path CR, path downstaging, pathologic residual muscle invasive disease. I would like to see how these patients do uh, because it's interesting to see whether you know we can have in the future more granularity about which patients need adjuvant therapy. And the data from the Tombola trial that we saw by Dr. Jensen at ESMO and the ongoing modern trial by Dr. Kogalski Alliance in the US and the Invigo 011 trial by Professor Pauls and others, all those trials will help this dialogue, right? We'll get bits and pieces of data sets that can help inform the answer. I think we're going to overtreat patients at the same time. We want to avoid under-treating as well. Yes. So it's that, that fine balance and it makes a discussion with the patient. The last point I will make is in the same presidential discussion that I was honored to be part of at ESMO, there was a great presentation uh, by Dr. Smith from Keynote 52 trial in breast cancer. Very similar story. And uh, Dr. Marlene Koch did the discussion and we had very similar themes, similar concepts and similar questions between breast cancer and bladder cancer. And one of the questions was in the path logic complete response subset. Do you need to continue at adjuvant IO? And, and in the breast cancer uh, study, if I remember correctly the data, you can double check me. I think for the path CR subject, there was still hazard ratio 0 0.69 in those who continued adjuvant Pembro versus not in the breast cancer study. Of course, this was a wide confidence interval overlapping, you know, crossing one. So the question is still out there. You know, I don't think they have answered the question even in breast cancer with much longer follow-up. So the question is, are we're going to ever find out, right, in our uh, uh, study in Niagara in, in, in our bladder cancer field. However, we have many trials going on. We have, of course, Niagara with longer follow-up. We have Kino 
about H66 uh, and uh, uh, with GEM cis plus minus Pebro, we have GEM cis plus minus Nevo, and we have the EV Pembro trials, Keynote B15, uh, Keynote 905, the Volga trial, all of those will contribute to this dialogue. And I think in the next few years, uh, I think uh, localized MIBC will be a completely different disease and different outcomes, better outcomes for our patients. We're going to cure more patients. And the question is escalation, de-escalation, biomarkers, that will be an ongoing effort. I love it, Petros. I mean, we're so fortunate in the bladder where we're in the golden age for treatment. And, you know, for right now, standard of care, it's wonderful. Congratulations, Dr. Tom Powell's, all of the patients, all of the support group, all of the PIs. I think it's great. And now we can build on this. It's a great foundation. So really enjoy our conversation, Petros. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.